Hey, hey, good afternoon, Scott Luton and Kelly Barner on today's live stream here at Supply Chain Now. Dial P for procurement. Kelly, how are you doing? Dial P, I am doing great and ready to go. <laughs> we are too. Well, you know, we have had a ton of response uh, from the marketplace, a ton of feedback in uh, these Dial P, uh, this Dial P live stream series. In fact, so much so, Kelly Barner is in demand so much so that uh, we've got some upcoming video podcasts with, with procurement yeah. leaders around the world, right? We absolutely do. And I think we're going to bring some very unique perspectives, not only on global business culture, but also I know procurement, procurement, procurement all the time, but there's segments within procurement. So we're going to get into public sector procurement. We're going to slice and dice it a little bit to keep it interesting for everybody. Agreed. And But as always, it's driven by great partnerships and great leaders that jump on as our guests and share their yes. content. We've got both today. So uh, first programming note here, of course, this series is presented jointly with our wonderful friends over at Buyers Meeting Point. We appreciate that partnership and relationship with your team, Kelly. And secondly, we've got two incredible guests here today. Yes, One, One's a dear old friend and one is a dear new friend. And so stay tuned for a conversation all about risk. Can we talk enough about risk in this soon to be post pandemic environment? It kind of depends on where you are in the world. I, I imagine some folks feel squarely in post pandemic uh, uh, land. Others are, are fighting to get there, but risk, risk, risk. Is that right, Kelly? All the time. And we're going to really challenge ourselves and our two guests today to obviously talk about the realities of risk but to be as positive and opportunistic about it as possible. Cause I think that's a real challenge, but it's a huge opportunity for anybody who can seize it. Excellent point. Now um, a couple of quick programming notes, cause I think you're going to share a couple of key takeaways from a big event that y'all had recently mastermind live the spring version, but really quick. Hey, uh, if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to find supply chain now and art of procurement uh, wherever you get your podcast from great, episodes there subscribe so you don't miss a single thing and we'll bring in our guests here momentarily but uh kelly before we do you gotta you gotta give up the goods what are some key takeaways from that uh popular event y'all hosted uh was it, it was last week already god it feels like this week it was last week i know well when you live it it's sort of like you we did it for the whole two days it was april 13th and 14th and we got to the end and you are so thrilled at how well it went, but you're also, your gas tank is absolutely empty. Um, so Art of Procurement Mastermind Live Spring, we had hundreds of highly engaged procurement practitioners, professionals, consultants, everybody from the community coming together to discuss really the urgency of the present moment. Um, and yet even with that idea of urgency, it stayed very positive. It was growth oriented and we heard some really fascinating things. I think some of what really stands out for me is we had an economist from Lloyds Bank in London, and he was talking to us about maybe some of the recovery conditions we're going to see. And he actually cautioned, when you start to see really good news, if you think you're entering sort of a boom time level of growth, be very careful because it could be short term. So obviously you want to seize that opportunity without actually restructuring for it. Um, we also had some opportunities about what sorts of expertise need to exist within the company versus what you should actually pull from experts out in the market that live something 24-7, 365. Some very detailed conversations there as well. And I know we'll get into some of that once we, we bring the guests in, but it was, we're in a challenging time and we're being real about it. But as Mike Griswold recently said on Supply Chain Now, this is a time when a ton is being asked of procurement organizations, leaders and professionals, and we have to step up. A ton is being looked for from us right now. Excellent. And I, I would add to that, uh, Greg White, my dear friend and typical co-host, uh, joined us on The Buzz on Monday. He said, hey, supply chain uh, has asked and demanded for a seat at the table. You got to yes. be careful what you ask for because now the chips are down and you got to oh, deliver. Absolutely. And that was a, so both of those points, I appreciate you sharing what Mike had shared. Okay. So a ton of good stuff in store. Y'all stay tuned. We're going to say hello to a few folks that are tuned in really across, uh, across our globe here, ever shrinking globe. Shrinivas is back uh, via LinkedIn from India. Thank you for joining us. Shrinivas look forward to your input today. Peter Bolay from Canada is with us once again. 
Uh, steady Eddie right there. And looking forward to getting an update on, on those renovations, Peter. I see Ahmad is tuned in via LinkedIn. Hello from Saudi Arabia. Welcome in, Ahmad. Great to have you. Kavan is back. What a great new timer. Oh, well, hey, that goes to uh, Clay and Bradley. Put that together, Kavan. And we're referring to that music as kind of our Yanni landscape music, putting everybody at peace. So great to have you, Kavan. Hadn't forgotten the new abnormal. Your your ears have been burning probably this morning as I was using that term. Uh, let's see. Mervin is tuned in via Dublin. Great to see you here, Mervin, as always. Denusia from Chattanooga. A lot, of things, a lot of good things going on in Chattanooga. Great to see you here. Hopefully I got your name right. If you didn't, please correct me. Helene tuned in from France via LinkedIn. Great to see wow. you. Goodness, and this what an international audience we have today. This is amazing. Quite one. Well, we've got these two big guests and the one and only Kelly Barner. So I would expect <laughs> it. Uh, and as always, standard disclaimer, if I get your name wrong as a shout out, please shoot us a note. Uh, I can be a, a, a bit slow, a slow learner sometimes. David is with us. Great to see you, David. Todd Rains, the Rainmaker, is tuned in with us as always via LinkedIn. Great to have Todd with us. Peter Stangelon. And Peter, I hope this is okay. The sustainability Viking is what Greg White has has termed you after <laughs> y'all's great interview on Tequila Sunrise. So great to see you here as well. Uh, Larry is with us. Hey, great to see you. And it looks like, hey, hey Clay. Uh, <laughs> good job, Clay. Reaching out. Personal service. Making it all about. Call. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Kyle is with us via freight, uh, via LinkedIn, but also Kyle with freight plus putting out great content. And finally, as Aaliyah, uh, as Aaliyah, looking forward to your uh, point of view as always. So you're, you're creating a standard for yourself. So I hope you're, you're ready to go on the edge of your seat and hello to everyone else that we could not, uh, get to here. All right. Not yet. We'll try to carve out as much time for our, uh, our folks in the cheap seats, as we call uh, call them, for, to share their POV. All right, so Kelly, are you ready? I am ready. I am ready too. So let's welcome in our two distinguished guests here today. We have Kara Kose, Senior Director of Supply Chain Research from Gartner, and Philip Odson, Founder and Managing Director of Art of Procurement. Hey, hey, good afternoon, gentlemen. How are we doing? Good. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for inviting us. And thank you, Kelly. Hi, guys. Very well. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, great to have you. Absolutely great to have you. So, Kelly, we're going to have a good time as we as we kind of warm things up. Before we get to the heavy lifting with, with both of you, uh, we're going to go through our lightning round. Right, Kelly? We are. And this is, for anybody who has not actually participated in one of these live streams, this is the hardest part to prep. And it's the hardest part to participate in. So we're going to let Karai and Phil cross this hurdle early on. It's when we dig into these quirky personal questions that it's really tricky. They can handle the supply chain stuff and the risk <laughs> stuff and the procurement stuff. No problem. It's the lightning round that's difficult. Amen. That's right. Well, well said. All right. But, but it's always tons of fun. Tons of fun. So we're going to talk about how, hey, risk isn't all bad, right? Sometimes it can be a wonderful thing to experience and fight through. So speaking of, and, and Kara, I want to start with you. Can you share a time in your journey where you took maybe a big personal risk, but it paid off in spades? I can think of only what got me into procurement and supply chain, of course, in this context, which was uh, at my time at Volkswagen, I was uh, offered an opportunity to work very closely with the back then and almost until now CPO uh, Francisco Garcia Sanz, uh, who gave me an opportunity to go to Mexico, which I haven't really heard about much back then. I did not speak any Spanish whatsoever. And, and they said, sure, go, you know, um, we'll take care of you, of course, right? So uh, I made my way to Mexico and um, spent some time there, learned the language, learned my means to get around in a different culture, in a different business environment, and really dive deeper into the complexities of the global supply chain. Now, did that, uh, you know, did, was it a real risk? 
for me personally, it felt awful, right? So <laughs> totally outside of my comfort zone. Now, you know, some of the more uh, maybe uh, suspicious comments could be like, wait a moment, you went there with Fox Wang, what could happen, right? You know, uh, for me personally, that was not even in the picture. It was really getting on a plane, like completely off the grid from Europe and go into a place where I had really no means of understanding the people, no understanding about the culture. I mean, call me ignorant at that point in time. I, of course, tried to read up on it as quick as possible, but it's not comparable to what you live through when you really go that much out of your comfort zone. I would recommend that everyone, by the way. Um, and yeah, that kind of like, you know, stick with me through, well, nowadays that we're talking about supply chain. So uh, I have to thank supply chain for that opportunity, but I was scared, uh, well, to be honest. I appreciate that transparency and there's so much good stuff there, what you shared. And I would just add all consumers and all professionals, we, there's a lot of gratitude uh, that should be extended to the global supply chain profession. So, and, you know, outside of our comfort zone is where so many gains can be made. Right. And, and, and whether that's per personal or professional, uh, whether it related to some of the change that we're all working hard to, to, to lead and to drive really in supply chain and beyond. So I love what, I love how you're starting this lightning round. It's not so lightning round here today. <laughs> Karai. Okay. Phil, same question. Yeah. To you. Where, where's a, where's a, a personal moment where you've benefited from taking some risk? Yeah, you know, I'm actually glad you asked Corey first. And I have a similar experience in terms of I moved to India um, and lived in India for a year, a similar kind of experience where um, it helped me really. I, I went over there to lead a team in a shared services organization for procurement, and that opened the world for me of outsourcing, about tasking, um, and kind of the world of talent that exists beyond um, the borders that we have, you know, within our own countries that sometimes we don't see unless you go and experience other cultures um, um, and have the other experiences. But, you know, as I'm thinking about a risk that I took, um, actually starting the podcast, starting the Art of Procurement podcast, it's funny, you know, when I, uh, I left the corporate world, I was, um, you know, fortunate to be with big employers and decided I was going to set my own business up. Uh, but I was really scared. Like I was always the, the person at the back of the, the conference room rather than the front of it. Um, but I knew that I had to start getting in front of people and getting folks to know who I was and hopefully that I can trust me. Um, and I was scared crazy of, of putting myself out there for a podcast, but I always believe in putting yourself in uncomfortable uh, situations as a way of learning. So I didn't have a clue what I was doing, didn't know if anyone was ever going to listen, you know, and five and a half years later, we're 400 episodes in and it's been a real kind of, it's, it's changed my life and the opportunities that I've had. Love that. Love that so much. Uh, all right, so you mentioned India. We got to say mm -hmm. a quick shout out to Vinay, who is tuned in via LinkedIn from India. And uh, I was talking this morning with Daria Patel, who is also living in India, is about to move to Atlanta. And we, you know, he was he was filling me in and teaching me all about cricket. And we yep. talked about the <laughs> Bangalore Royal Challengers, who's leading the Indian Premier League right now. So uh, never heard, uh, uh, let's see, protect the stumps. You know, mm -hmm. some other phrases that hitting, <laughs> hitting the six. I was so I'm behind the curve on learning all about this fascinating sport. So you know, love that. I could spend the next hour teaching you about cricket. And just a really <laughs> quick anecdote. One of the things that I did while I was there is we, we created a side deck of teaching cricket to Americans as a cultural, as a way to, to bridge kind of the cultures. My boss, I love actually, that. his father played for the Detroit Tigers in the, uh, the 1968 uh, World Series winning team. So they wow. had like baseball in his heritage. So it's like comparing cricket and baseball as a way to uh, um, to help, like I say, bridge the kind of cultural divide, if you will. I love it. You got we got to constantly in this global uh, society, global business world we live in, look for those. You know, blessed be the ties that bind for sure. Mm -hmm. So I love that, Phil. Okay, second and final question for the lightning round. Karai, what's the first thing you plan to do when we finally get back to some version of the normal? <laughs> All right. I would I would probably start with very uh, with something very simple and maybe just 
get together with friends and family in your backyard without, you know, distancing yourself. I, uh, you know, with one, two beers, you know, you usually are getting closer to your friends and you, you know, punch him or hug him or whatever is happening in, you know, the dynamics in your backyard, right? Uh, with doing that without, you know, having the concern, oh my God, am I feverish? Am I coughing? You know, what's going on? And um, I think that would be a really nice kickoff. And then I have a list that's endless, you know, uh, but I think I would start with the small things that can just be so important sometimes. Wonderful. I love that. Uh, Karai, same question for you, Phil. Yeah, I think getting on a, an airplane and going back to England, um, you know, see family, watch some football, um, you know, all the things that we've missed over the, uh, the next 18 months. I have my plane ticket, so fingers crossed that this time it uh, doesn't get canceled. Awesome. And we, we also can catch an Oasis concert together, right, Phil? Yeah. Um, <laughs> these days, I guess it's just Noel Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hopefully there's a few Oasis fans out there in the cheap seats. Okay, Kelly, <laughs> where are we going from, from here? So from here, we're going to start gradually making the move towards procurement supply chain. Um, and Karai, I actually, I should have known this. I didn't realize you work for Volkswagen. So automotive is something that you and Phil have in common. Uh, but I do know you've lurked in a lot of different verticals and industries. Uh, when you think back through all of those experiences, what are the things that seem to be common? And what did you find were the things that tended to vary by industry? All right. So <laughs> what I see very common is just the positioning of uh, supply chain procurement and sourcing in the context of managing basically everything through, right? And having a many hats in different meetings that you just have to flip almost like on an ad hoc comment. And at that same point in time, you need to watch out for your constituents to not upset anyone because your relationships are really the main driver for your success. And and um, I heard it the, the hard way because for me it was like, hey, you know, we manage all the funding and we funnel through basically the value generation process of a company. So why is nobody just listening to me and just doing and not all the time questioning us? Uh, or the opposite, actually, why are they all the time questioning us? So um, being in that kind of a seat with that many, I think, connections towards everything but being looked at as a cost center, as a support function, as a group which may report to the most craziest of organizational structures, right? I reported once into legal, once into finance, once into, you know, supply chain logistics. And uh, I mean, all sorts of different things. Um, I think that's very common. When it comes to the positioning power, though, I can see industries that really, I would say, appreciate the ability to drive value through supply chain more than else in other industries. And I think one of the maybe the, the worst things happened to me is that I started in automotive because that's the place where procurement has the seat in, yes. uh, in the house. It's a seat holder, you know, it's <laughs> not just the CEO and then it's the CPO and not a CFO or a CMO or so that's all irrelevant and not really, but you know, I don't want to upset anybody out there, but <laughs> there is really the center of power in supply chains, which is specifically in procurement and in automotive. So I got that into my habits very early and had to unlearn the fact that it's not like that in a lot of places. But uh, that's unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you how you look at things. But I, I think it is, in my opinion, really a must have. And um, it's unfortunate that some industries struggle to see the value in that. When we think about organizations where there is not much direct, but a lot of indirect procurement and sourcing, you see sourcing to really turn into sort of like you know, a, a back office function, which a lot of companies or functions struggle to keep, you know, um, their voice heard. So I think there is a differentiation um, that we can see in different industries. Yet the same thing applies. You can't be in the seat that has a lot of power without caring about your relationships and kind of bringing everybody on the journey as hard as it sounds. Yeah. So Phil, let me then come to you because I know you and I have had a lot of conversations about how being in procurement in automotive is very unique and is mm -hmm. different than being in procurement in a lot of other industries. Yep. Anything that you wanted to add to what Karai shared specifically about that? 
Yeah, it's really interesting. So my background was starting with Ford Motor Company and then with OEMs that were attached to the automotive industry. So you do go there and, and, and procurement or purchasing, as it typically is within those companies, is the center of the world. You know, I then moved out to, um, to pharmaceutical to uh, Pfizer. And, you know, it's kind of chalk and cheese when you go pharma and automotive in terms of the role of procurement. Or it was, you know, 15 years ago when I made that role. But, you know, when you think about risk, risk in automotive is, well, it's not, you know, priority number one, because priority number one is how can I get one more cent of reduction, you know, out of my, um, my suppliers, because my margins are so thin, but it's definitely number two. Uh, you know, you're looking at quality, delivery, risk, all as kind of a, a, a really important. And so you have that lens in everything you do. When you step out of automotive, you know, I've worked in uh, consumer products and financial services and technology and, you know, seen a, a lot of different industries. I found that in most of those other industries, the importance of risk is defined by the regulator as opposed to the company itself. Um, so there are a few companies who really go above and beyond kind of what the regulatory requirements are for risk in their industry. And I think that's a big miss for us as procurement yeah. professionals mm. to take some of the best practices that you see within an automotive business or either within financial services because of how heavily it's re regulated and apply those to some non, you know, manufacturing, non-financial services uh, businesses. That's an opportunity for us, I think. So yeah. I, I'm going to pose a couple of quick comments here, but really quick uh, in, in a broad generalization. Would, do we, would we have agreement here? I, I think the automotive industry perhaps is going to transform more than just about any other industry over the next maybe even three or four years, certainly you know six or seven years. Uh, even though there's a ton of best practices that both of you are speaking to and that even uh, Randy Smith says, hey, Karai, absolutely. So many industries would yeah. benefit from an automotive procurement structure. Still, the industry is, is transforming as we speak. Uh, would you all agree with that generally? We could probably do a whole... Uh, I, I would say as an industry, yes. Unfortunately, some industry players won't get the message yet mm -hmm. because I can see some, you know, disruption happening through the technology switch and the pace of it that some of the bigger players just caught up in the middle because, you know, while they have the power, they don't seem to sense what's going on in the markets sometimes. Yes, it yeah. seems like some <laughs> have been. Sorry, yeah, I want to be careful. What I, no, it's <laughs> no, good. No, no. <laughs> a lot of folks are equipped with hammers. A lot of those automotive executives are, you know, they're used to hammering, yeah. you know, for for most of the old fashioned, you know, kind yeah. of traditional way of doing business. So, so I, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, uh, take us down a. Um, no, a, uh, just a comment there. Maybe I don't want to, you know, fall into your comments, but research shows from our side that the industry that shows the least collaborative uh, approach and uh, the benefits out of, uh, you know, supplier relationships is automotive. That is an excellent point. Ex thank you very much for sharing. I think that uh, that is deserving of a conversation of itself. And I bet you and Phil could could have ex uh, exchange war stories here. Todd Rain says, having spent my career in automotive, it's unique to hear of someone that escaped, escaped our world. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and then going back to what Asalea said, hey, Karai, I hear you saying professional and social agility as one form of intelligence and tool, critical tool to have in our tool belt. Great call out there. Okay. So Kelly, let's see here. Right, let me, let me, yes. let me put a period on this automotive, uh, conversation. Randy says in his consulting experience, automotive is always at least five to seven years in front of other industries. Okay. We got, we, we take all viewpoints here. Okay. So Kelly, where are we going to next? We're actually going to take our cue from Azalea. Thank you for that. And we're going to stay on this topic of agility and resilience. Um, so Karai, Logistics Magazine recently quoted you in an article as saying that 90% of organizations plan to invest money and time to make their supply chains more resilient over the next two years. What form do you expect that resilience to take? So if we're sitting on the outside of these companies, what should we be maybe looking for as symptoms of that strengthened resilience? 
<laughs> but before I get into that, maybe let's. I, I want everybody to hear this because they are mixing up resilience and agility very often. So, just shortly put, agility is the ability to maneuver rather quickly, seeing something happening and trying to get out of its way or utilizing the event for your benefits. That's agility, meaning like your organization is flexible, your technologies are very sensible to changes and sensitive to changes. They are helping and augmenting your capabilities so you can act not react. So that's agility. When we talk about resilience, it's like you cannot always, you know, act in an event because some events are unknown, unknown events, right? Black swan events. <laughs> Oops, there is a pandemic coming. So um, when you look at that, then you need resilience. That's like absorbing a shock, right? Like you get the hit, but you just continue, right? And that's where things are really important and more fundamental. So structural changes require resilience to get through them. Uh, uh, uncertain, sudden events require agility to maneuver and maybe even reduce the impact that you would have felt otherwise. So in combination, that's becoming a true competitive advantage. So when you look at the investment requirements to get there, that can take a lot of different shapes. We're talking about six to seven different um, drivers for resilience and agility. One of that, of course, is understanding who you're working with, network visibility. In some industries, it's horrifically low, even though regulations and governance requirements are very high. So some of it is interpreted in some parts and means of the way you work, right? So, uh, you know, you have payments going to the to the right accounts, that's you know visibility, but in supply chain, you may not even know the supplier who you just paid ad hoc. So visibility is really a, a means to be more aware of what's going on and then to put yeah. actions in place to diversify your supply base, to increase your collaborations, to look into your contracts, look at some resiliency factors in your contract. Do you even have SLAs defined, right? Maybe you started a small contract and it became a monster after years. Yeah. We see that all the time, those nice SO W's that are just amended all the time, right? And suddenly you have like a gazillion different things that are even in itself not cohesive. So that's one, right? And then there's another one. Are there any incentives to get more resilient? Uh, Philip just said, you know, cost efficiency drivers in automotive. Let's walk away from automotive. In any industry, cost efficiency is usually the optimization of one variable, uh, cost. Uh, sometimes if you're lucky, quality, right? But that's the end. Um, so cost efficiency is out, cost effectiveness is in. So can you convince a value generation process that keeps all factors in balance, offers a product that there is a willingness to pay with a, with a good margin for your clients and then move on and become a competitive leader in a space? And now I'm not avoiding your question, but there are different means companies yeah. invest, but groundbreaking yeah. is people, processes and technology. And for every company, it's a variety of it. So no company has just the resilience. It's right. in pockets. You may have areas of low resilience with linear supply chains, which automotive has, and others also have, like pharma has linear supply chains, right? Why do you do that? I, I don't wrap my head around it. And then others, uh, uh, other areas of uh, high resilience. And there are gazillion excuses why a linear supply chain should be more competitive. There is zero evidence that it is more competitive, meaning <clears throat> single source is, I call it, a management mistake, quite honestly, and sole source is a design mistake. Both are mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's a relationship that is not balanced. It's toxic in the long term. It's non-competitive in the cost of the supply chain, and it's absolutely zero resilient. Now, it's interesting when we when I think about that, right, there's clearly a core philosophy that you have about supply chains. I love your point about resilience being different than agility. Um, yes, totally agree with you, Kaivan, that cost is still the most crucial objective. And yet it's maybe the most crucial among many that are very close seconds. Um, so Phil, for just a second before we move on to actually talk about risk. We I don't want to be it. provocative. I don't want to be provocative, but I disagree. Is this the, because, is this the no. punching part of the cookout, Karai? Is that's this that's the, right. I put off. Put, either I put on the, the gloves or off. Hugging. Right. That's the backyard party, right? <laughs> I was talking about. No, because think about it again. Like it has to be value is the crucial part of it. If you say cost, then you're back to cost efficiency, the one variable game, and then you are non-resilient. I agree that 
the outside world, we have to recognize that a lot of people run yeah. around and say cost is really the. So you have to work on explaining and time and again proving the point that value is the most important thing. Um, just but measuring that. that value, right? Yeah. This is where we get into into a a real challenge. And so, Phil, when we think about the philosophy of balancing the value that mm -hmm. we need to create with obviously the cost savings we need to deliver, we've had a lot of conversation at our procurement about allowing procurement to align with what the business really needs. Yep. So it's not necessarily, you know, how do I do agility? How do I do resilience? There needs to be a mindset that goes along with that. What would you say around and this is for you, Jan Griffiths. What would you say around the mindset that we all need to have that we talked about so much at Mastermind Live Spring around the way that we think, allowing us to both align with the, vis the business and emphasize that agility and value over just straight cost savings? Mm -hmm. Now, I would say, first of all, I completely agree with Corey. Like we, we're on a mission to, to try and help procurement think differently about the impact that they can have on the business that goes beyond cost savings. Um, and it, it has a value a, a value conversation, but that's uh, it takes time to get to that. Uh, and it's obviously very specific on the organization. The most important thing you said there is about alignment. What truly is important to the business? What do they need to succeed in their market? How can we best connect supply markets and supply chains with that need? It might be margin improvement. It could be uh, quality, it could be uh, service innovation. You don't really know until you have the conversation. Um, from a mindset perspective, I think it's more internal to procurement to start with than it is external of the folks outside of procurement. Because while we as procurement professionals think about ourselves and our profession as being cost first, we're always going to look at that as the, the tactics and the strategies that we use of what we think of how we measure our self-worth essentially to our organization, regardless of how we measured um, on a scorecard to the executives. But also because so many executives, we've, 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 we've built the profession of procurement on this notion that the ROI should only be measured on cost savings. And so you have a CFO in a conversation with a CFO. We've told that CFO for the last 20 years give me this money to professionalize procurement because I'm going to return X dollars in savings to you or X pounds or X euros or whatever that number is. So their only perception of what procurement can do for them is cost savings because that's all we've ever told them we can do. So I think that's the conversation that we have to have with our executives is like, how can we connect all these supply chains and suppliers with the needs of the business? It's in a different way than just thinking about cost because until we do that, that's all we're going to be asked to do. And you kind of painted in this box. And I think that's really critical in terms of getting out and create, doing all these wonderful things we can from value creation that goes beyond what we do from a day to day, which is always get painted into this cost savings box. Got to elevate the conversation, right? Got to elevate it. You, you got to fight it, yeah. fight to get at that pigeonhole and, and elevate the craft of procurement. Yeah. And it's, that's our where, it's our right. personal responsibility. You know, so often I see, so we did a survey in our event last year in October. And we said, what's the number one challenge that procurement leaders are facing right now? Um, and we had, you know, I think five, 600 responses from that. And the number one thing that came up, I was hoping it would be, you know, we don't have enough data. We don't have the expertise that we need. Um, we, you know, need help from a talent perspective. No, the number one reason that came up was the perception of procurement. So we're basically saying, nobody knows what we do. And that's the biggest challenge to what we do. And looking at that as being an external problem that people don't understand us, rather than an internal problem, that it's on us to help educate and to show with doing and through results of what the art of the possible is um, yeah. and that prior focus. Excellent point, Phil. I, just to interject, I think um, just like the last 18 months or so has, has shaped uh, global supply chain, certainly has shaped the view and per, um, perception of uh, logistics, mm -hmm. uh, retail, yeah. Uh, it's transformed and made, you know, as much as, you know, say 10 years ago, lean was on the tip of every manufacturing tongue. Now it's customer experience, right? The, the pandemic's had so much, so, so much of a big impact. I would add procurement to that list for sure. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's created, I think, generally speaking, again, a different perception, uh, of forward thinking leaders of how procurement, real procurement practitioners can be strategic and can, you know, go back to add real meaningful value 
in the overall resilience equation. If the, if 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 everyone if anyone's nailed that down to a specific equation just yet, so. I don't want to take us, uh, Kelly, I'm bad today. I must have not had <laughs> enough coffee. I'm going right and I'm going left, but there's so much to talk about. So Kelly, yeah. what are we, what are we talking about next? So next we really are going to take on that risk head on. And, and one of the things staying on the theme of perception, I think that's the perfect word. So there is the level of risk. And then there's the way procurement perceives the risk. There's the way finance perceives the risk. There's the way supply chain perceives the risk. And there's the way the C-suite perceives the risk. So, you know, when you go to the doctor, they typically have hanging in the room, that little rainbow set of faces all the way from like ice cream cone to hit in the head with a hammer. You know, think about that range of emotions. And, and Phil, let me start with you on this. Where do you think most procurement leaders and most executives in general are today around their perception of risk and how it actually mm -hmm. makes them feel sort of emotionally? Yeah, I think that uh, I think it's probably something that more than ever keeps up both of those um, different um, sets of people. It keeps them up at night more than before. I think it probably worries a procurement person more than it worries worries an executive. Perhaps finance uh, is uh, an exception to that. I do feel like risk has always been an area where, uh, again, outside of automotive industry, where it's kind of understood uh, in more general business, risk is an area that's not truly understood are seen as being um, um, a particularly important issue from a business executive perspective versus a procurement perspective. So there's always that battle of how do you help uh, the business understand that they need to invest in risk mitigation because it's not something that's necessarily thought of, at least in my experience. And I think, of course, the pandemic yeah. changes that. But I also see, like every big event, whether it's uh, Fukushima or whether it's you know what's going on with the pandemic, um, you know, the Olympics um, in Beijing brought a lot of risk events from manufacturing in China. Um, it kind of gets forgotten about easily um, yeah. once the risk has passed. And I still think that's a worry. And I, uh, that's a risk in itself of, as we look out, you know, in the next 12, 18 months. Yeah. What do you think, Karai? Do, do you agree? Do you, do you get the same sense that people's perception of risk is still at both a very high level and, and you know, keep you up at night worrisome? I think <clears throat> it's a very personal um, thing, right? It's defined by your experiences and your character. And likewise, an organization has that. And it comes in all shapes and forms, from paranoid to insane and something in the middle. And when you think about that now in a different means, uh, you have a business strategy, a value, a mission, very, you have that, right, given. That is the what. What are you going to do, right? And then a lot of companies just don't have the how. They just leave the how to everybody involved in creating the what. And if you do that, you have a mosaic, a puzzle. You can call it diverse. But in this sense, that diversity does not help because you want to move forward organizationally. So you need something like an equal business strategy definition called risk appetite statement. Again, research shows on my end that only three out of 10 companies have anything defined on an organizational level. And if you take finance out of the equation because of financial crisis, crisis, everybody in the regulations had to add something like that into their reporting, then it's actually only one out of 10 companies have something like that organizationally. And now what do you do with a business strategy in procurement? Well, you break yeah. down activities to support it. Same thing in risk appetite. You need to break it down to what look good looks like, what is okay for you to do in supply chain to support the achievement and exceed maybe the business strategy within the means of your company. Yeah. That is called cascading down your risk appetite statement. And then if you look at the data there, it's one out of 10 companies generally take finance out of the equation, three out of 100. So mm -hmm. what that means is everybody has their own risk hat on and some are risk averse, some are risk takers. Like I said, anywhere from paranoid to insane and in the middle and normal, well, whatever normal is, right? You have this spread and then you may think about the people who have been always achieving the performance targets year over year, year over year over year. Was that you know, within the means? Is there something different that they are doing than others? And you think about cost savings as another example where you think about, you know, year over year savings concept, which I have been fighting for my last decade or so. For me, it's uh, if there is a production process, you have continuous learning in it, and you can really improve the costing of the product. But there is no shape or form in any economy that you will expect to pay less in 10 years for a product than you 
do today. I don't know if you've been to ice cream shop 10 years ago, right? Did you pay really more 10 years ago than today? I mean, no. But then the year over year just say, gotten worse, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, exactly. So think about that. Like, how can you achieve that? And everybody just, you know, seems to to one shape or form ignore that. And of course, you achieve your savings if you pay more upfront. So right. is it like the system you acquaint mm -hmm. yourself to, or you want to disrupt it and truly create what you need to do out of the risk posture you're taking? Are you taking too much risk? Who benefits from it? Maybe you don't actually, and the company does. So mm. that thing requires an alignment as as rigid and I, th I think needs to be governed as well as a business strategy. Agreed. Hey, Kelly, I want to take a quick pulse of, of the folks uh, in our community in the comments. I'd love to, you know, we we're talking about um, your appetite for risk is what uh, mm -hmm. Kara was talking about. Let's use a simple scale, one to 10. One means you're a nervous Nelly, you hate risk, you avoid risk, you're very, very conservative. And 10 is... <laughs> Skydiving. Yes, skydiving, <laughs> yes. Uh, no parachute. <laughs> no parachute. Uh, you know, you're out there. Yeah. So if y'all, especially, to, you know, we welcome everyone to kind of uh, tell us where you sit in terms of risk appetite. One, extremely conservative. Ten, you can't get enough risk. Drop that in the comments. Um, okay. So, Kelly, so much good stuff we're talking about here. And we still have yes. yet to get to some other key takeaways from the event last week, right? We do. Well, and, and one of them, I was actually thinking about this, Phil, while Karai was talking. One of the points that really stood out in my mind was something that Nancy Nickel, who works for RBS at Ajo Del Hayes, uh grocery chains up and down the, the east coast of the U.S., talked about you can't continue to put the same spend through the same sourcing process and expect different results. Right. Right. So somewhere along the way and whether it means taking a risk or whether it just means getting a better understanding of what the business needs, we have to be willing to change something. So when you think about what procurement has the ability to do in uncertain conditions, what are the assets or the advantages or the strengths that you think we intuitively have that we should really be trying to bring to the forefront right now? Yeah, there's probably a couple of things that comes to mind. You know, it's actually building on what Corey said about it has to be an enterprise. There has to be an enterprise perspective on risk. And I mentioned it right at the top. You know, risk exists in businesses where it's it's already known as being important. And we talked about automotive and also in, in industries where it's heavily regulated. And financial services was really the one that I was alluding to. Um, I had the pleasure of being a part of a team that built out a risk um, program for procurement while the Federal Reserve watched us doing it you know and if we didn't do it the way we should then everyone in that building was getting fired from the ceo on down um it was during the financial crisis about 12 years ago and we were given a banking charter that we weren't really deserving of so we could get some bailout funds so it was very political so really interesting kind of environment where you see things being built coming back to like we see everything we have the opportunity as procurement and supply chain to see everything across the business um, I think that it's our responsibility where that centralized approach to risk and you start talking about risk statements and risk registers and the governance around that, we have the, the ability to bring that together and to have our, our organizations think a little bit more holistically about risk as opposed to just lamenting that it doesn't exist, which I think is often case the time. Or we go off and we do things in our own silo with the best intentions but you're fighting what Corey said about individuals and individuals' risk appetite and how much that varies just across the board. The other thing uh, I think that we're in a position to help our businesses think about, but also influence, and this is something I talked about uh, during our event last week, is the notion of optionality. Like, think about when you're contracting. You know, when you're contracting for something, you're usually putting a contract in place and you might put it in place for three years or five years, and then maybe some kind of termination language in there. We don't really think about, we don't run what if analysis and scenario planning to think about, you know, if something happens, how are we protected from a contractual perspective? How will we actually have the ability to get out or to maneuver or to change? And, you know, is it worth us paying a premium to have that optionality in a contract? Um, you know, I remember an, uh, um, an SVP of supply chain and procurement once telling me that, you know, whoever bears the risk pays the price, essentially. So are we prepared to pay to have optionality or are we going to put all that risk on our provider and therefore take the cheap price? Where are we? And that's a, a conversation I think that we can have um, as procurement professionals with our businesses. Yeah. And, and 
Karai, quick follow-up for you, and then Scott, maybe we can get some kind of super informal roundup on how everybody feels today. Um, <laughs> when you think about that risk appetite, right, that exists within each company, should procurement focus on trying to read the appetite, or is there anything in your opinion that we can do to move that needle, even if it's just a little bit? I would be cautious to recommend reading something like that because uh, you can't really understand necessarily the means of other organizational parts and the limitations they have. And assuming that would be sort of almost, I would say, arrogant for one siloed function if it's like that, or even one function that is non-siloed to assume I would not be able to say, hey, Kelly, you know, I think you're a four out of five. So yeah. I, I, that that would be a stranging a bit. So uh, when is we're- Is it a conversation thinking, then? Is it asking, do we, do we bring it into the open and ask the question? It is in the process of formalizing it. So everything needs to come back to formalization where the information is democratized. It's not something you do in the back office between the CEO, the CPO and the CFO, and then they come out with something that you know is uh, hand served to parts of the organization. It needs to be truly connective and it needs to be uh, contextualized then to each and every parts of the organization. So a uh, risk appetite does not mean this is the language and you apply it. It means actually to every category, something else. It means to a category that deals in a concentrated market, something else than it deals in a competitive market. And it also means something for the CFO to understand how and where to meet the funding requirements into investments into risk management. So when you want to go about this and you don't have a risk appetite and you are in a function like supply chain and procurement, I would certainly bring up the conversation about the need of having one and what are the benefits of having one. It's aligning the organization to optimize the results and the means of our processes and we're dealing with. And also driving technology investments, right? So if we're looking at an organization that is highly manual, that usually means it's very slow. So is an industry really slow or fast? If you're in a fast moving environment, then you are taking risk unconsciously and something may happen and the demise is near. So you need to take risks to implement technologies and fail and implement technologies and fail and implement technologies and maybe win, right? So, um, and, and that's something you need to incorporate into the thinking and ingrain into your formalized approach that actually is handed to people through communication of the business strategy alongside what's our risk posture. And that doesn't mean you have one, you have many risk postures. It just has to align with your risk capacity, with the ability to create cash, with the ability to move quickly on decisions, with the ability to utilize technology, to make analytics and scenario planning, something that just happens like that. And it's not like, oh my God, now this event happened. Now let's think what scenarios could happen because that's what we've seen. Pandemic and then companies are like, hmm, okay. So what scenario would happen if China locks down? Oh, okay, okay, now. And then suddenly Europe. Oh, what scenario happens if Europe locks down? It's sort of like retroactive thinking and that does not align well with forward compatibility. Yeah. Boy, there's so much, so much here to dissect. We're gonna have to add three <laughs> oh, more sorry. hours to. No, no, it's good. I, I mean that as a compliment between yeah. you and Phil and and Kelly's uh, excellent as always. Joe Montana quarterbacking of the of the conversations. A lot of good stuff to talk through here. Kavan makes a point that I think all three of y'all are speaking to it. It depends on the situation, scenario planning. That's one of the great things about you know, the, the, the information age we're living in now, and all the all the technologies that are out there. It's helping us not make. It's helping us make in the moment uh, based on the current set, set of circumstance decisions rather than grand policies that aren't a fit for all things. Mm -hmm. I, I love that aspect about what we're seeing. Um, also want to share that um, David talking about risk. It should not focus on the appetite, but sure. what's driving it. That's a great point. Kavan also, I think uh, Kara, I think said it could have been Phil, the price of robustness, the price of robustitude. Uh, I love that call out there. And then some folks have answered our question around their risk yeah. appetite. Uh, T squared, who holds down the fort at YouTube Force, about midway. So I'm gonna quantify that as a five. And Kavan, also a five. Interesting. And even our friend behind the scenes, uh, Amanda Luton. Where can I find her comment <laughs> there? She says she's probably a four to five. Scott is a much more of a risk taker than me. Fake news, Amanda. Fake news. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. We, we do like taking risk around. I think being an entrepreneur, it kind of comes with the territory in many ways. Okay. 
but but in the same breath, I think having wonderful people around you, it it, it creates uh, and trust. It creates situations where you can take more risk, and, and and it leads to business opportunities. But whether we're talking supply chain, whether we're talking digital content, or you name it, so um, so much and, and so much to talk about here. Catherine McCleary, hey Catherine, how you doing? Hi Catherine. She says risk postures. That is such an interesting angle on the overall planning for risk and allows for optimization. Excellent, excellent point. One final one, and and Amanda, I'm not sure Amanda and Clay who. I don't have uh, visibility into this user, but they say great point, especially recognizing the impact of pandemics, mother nature, supply and demand, right, complete the list of 5 million different factors, however you see fit. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. When they're, they're coming in fast and furiously, I got to share as Aaliyah says 7.5 on one to 10 scale. I love that as Aaliyah, good but she you, adds Aaliyah. a disclaimer yes. with a good team, Kelly. Yes. Which is incredibly important, right? Because it's the at the end of the day, not only is it whether or not you can rely on the folks around you, it's each of us perceiving how everybody else perceives the situation. Um, so as we kind of wrap up, and I always caution folks, we talked about this in the green room, how incredibly fast this hour is. But I can say these hours keep getting faster as we keep having these conversations. Um, Karai and Phil, one last question for you before we go into the really easy stuff. Super quick, what is something that you would say from what we've all just been through around risk that we should try not to internalize for the long term, right? So some of the things we're examining now, we're saying, okay, maybe we didn't have enough data. Maybe we didn't have enough insight. Maybe we weren't really digitally transformed. What is something we should try to keep short term as opposed to allowing it to change us permanently? Do you want to take that Who first, Corey? To... Yeah, yes, please, because I'm just thinking. <laughs> I, I can jump in if you want. Yeah, yeah yes, go for it. Go for it. Um, all right, so what I think about is the pendulum of how much bureaucracy we put behind risk identification and mitigation. So, you know, I talked about before being involved in um, responding to the financial crisis, an organization that had zero risk um, focus to one that you get um, such a risk kind of focus that the pendulum goes all the way over here and you're suddenly slowing the business down and you're actually creating a, an organization that can't move and can't be agile because you're putting too much bureaucracy in terms of identifying and then managing mitigating risk. So I just caution, you know, there are a lot of things that we can do coming out of the pandemic to build an infrastructure around how we identify risk that can be mitigated but don't go too far the other way that it really slows the business down into a crawl and it ends up having a negative effect. I agree with you because I think uh, that can become a vicious circle and uh, mm -hmm. it ends up at the same point if you wouldn't have actually done anything and you would have you know, gone into demise anyway. Um, the point I would maybe add is that when you think about risk, what you should not internalize that this event was a negative event and the next one will be a negative event as well. And um, risk is, and that's something again to step back, risk is neutral the outcome of the event mm -hmm. may impact you positively mm -hmm. or negatively. Entrepreneurs who succeed are looked as risk takers. I, I would say they weren't even knowing what they were getting into and they were lucky because they are being talked about positively, but maybe the 99% who fail, they will never make the news. So it's not like, you know, go into this industry and you will succeed. No. And over time, those organizations become more aware of their surroundings and they implement sort of of a posture that, that helps them to keep what they already achieved and grow out of that. So the same thing is for the pandemic and events like that. So don't look at it that the next one shall happen again the same way and you will be impacted the same way. And that doesn't mean that what you put into place now retroactively as a corrective action for that specific event will, will, will work in the future. So it's really about risk seen as something you need to optimize against. The pendulum is a good metaphor. Like, look at the balance your organization can strive for. It's almost like when you sail, right? Every boat has a 
different ability to go into the wind, right? So some have a degree of 30, some have 15, maybe. I don't know if that's physically possible, but if you look at America's car, and others, they are like, no, I just can't do any. And you know, you're, 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 you're slow and moving forward and you will never really succeed in the race. So that's where things I think need to happen in the mindset of the people. Don't think that now the pandemic needs to be fixed and now you're good, one thing, and you don't think that the next pandemic will not hit you in places. So just discover vulnerabilities as a continuous process. You will evolve too. Like, you know, Absolutely. when they sent me to Mexico, I had a very different risk appetite than if that <laughs> was now, right? Because you learn as an organization. So internalize the learnings and not just the impact you had out of it negatively. Excellent. Absolutely. Well stated. Hey, I just got a call. Hang on a sec. Oh. Captain Greg White agrees with your sailing uh, terminology, <laughs> every bit of it. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. That's a great visual. Um, and other folks have really enjoyed it. Todd Raines, love Karai's passion. Completely agree. Uh, let's see, Rhonda says, great point, Karai. Taking a risk doesn't mean success. If we have contingency plans in place, might not work out. Such is yeah. life. Agreed. Azalea like that. Mervin agrees with the, the comment stated that risks are neutral. They are our opportunities in line. Excellent point. Excellent point. Okay. So Kelly, this, to your point, the hour has zoomed it right has. by, right? But that's, that's what dial P has been. Uh, we, we get three of y'all uh, and your intellect together and, and gosh, you're going to blink and the hour's gone. We got to make sure folks know how to connect with both of our esteemed guests, right? Absolutely, so, we do. Well, and before, hang on. So, I, I want to want to share one more point here, uh, Andrea, and and hope this finds you well, Andrea. And as I hope your sister Sophia is doing well too. She says, if you're taking risk in your life decisions, the outcome will be good or bad, but you need to embrace the outcome and rethink the risk in the previous decision taking, and make variations to have a different result. I completely agree. And and as David said earlier, a comment I couldn't grab. The definition of insanity is just doing the same thing over and over and expecting those same uh, different results, right? Right. Okay. So, uh, Karay, uh, Karay you, you've got um, the start of a fan club here, and we've got a lot of folks that say, <laughs> okay. as says, got so many questions for Karay. Bring him back. So between you and Phil and Kelly, it's been quite a quite a discussion here. But how can folks connect with you and all the great things that, that Gartner's up to? Was that a question or yes? A how can yeah? How, how, how can folks uh, directly from the fan club, Chairman? How can folks connect <laughs> with you and compare notes? Are you active on LinkedIn and, and maybe you? I, you're I am active on LinkedIn. Uh, you can look up my profile with uh, just uh, at the end. You know, LinkedIn.com uh, slash uh, Korai. Kose, but that's OE because the umlaut O in Germany in the internet world of things it's OE. Uh, when you look that up, you'll find me. Uh, just add me and you know uh, hit me up with any questions or or anything like. You can probably see me in other places and conferences. I've been active in in different places as well. I'd love to come back. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for the invitation. I was uh, I was honored to be here. I was I had no clue what you know, I'm going to do here with the questions you may throw at me. So <laughs> I'm happy that some people actually appreciate it. Uh, hug, and punch, hug and punch, hug and punch, Karai. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it sounds well, like that. Karai, I'm so disappointed. Your daughter did not make an appearance. I just knew she was going to walk through. <laughs> yeah. I know. Next so time. So when the door, yeah, next time. Yeah. Next time. <laughs> okay. Phil, I, I, I really appreciate all that, that that you do out there. Congrats on such a, uh, a ton of success and growth over at uh, yeah. Art of Procurement. We appreciate your partnership and, and all the content you put out there to further the industry. That is so important. Um, and, of course, uh, as Kelly knows, I'm, I am co-chair of the Atlanta area Phil Odson fan club. I don't know if you knew that there, <laughs> Phil. But how can folks connect and, and compare notes with you? I always appreciate the good words you put out there, Scott. Um, you much better uh, salesman for me than I am, probably. <laughs> um, yeah, how can you connect with me? I'm active on LinkedIn as well, so you can always just go and look me up on LinkedIn. Um, we have the website, which is artofprocurement.com, um, and we have, I alluded to it earlier, we have a podcast once a week, every Monday. So wherever you get your podcasts, check us out. That's just Art of Procurement is the name of the pod. Um, you'll be able to hear more of our musings on the world of procurement and how... You know, we're trying to help everybody really elevate their impact. 
Awesome. One of the oldest and most distinguished procurement focused podcasts in the 2 million podcast universe and growing that we live in. So uh, I love that. Um, and we should also put out there, Gail, Michelle, there was a, there was a comment I shared earlier. I didn't know the uh, profile behind it. So Gail, thanks so much for yes. contributing. Gail. And Ulrich, um, the hits keep on coming. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Ulrich says he's been working with Kara for a long time. He's one of the best and most intelligent experts on supply chain management oh. and procurement. How about oh. that? I don't know how, how much that will cost me, but thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and Azalea is, is adding art procurement to her Spotify. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So Kayla, this has been so much fun. I hate to swoosh our guests out, but we're going to get, we're going to grab your final take after we yes. bid adieu. So again, huge thanks to Kara Kose, senior director of supply chain research at our friends at Gartner and Phil Odson, founder and managing director of art of procurement. Thanks to you both. Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you. Wow, man. Uh, ton of passion, ton of passion. So Kelly, the billion dollar question here, as we, after we, we, uh, had wrapped up that fast paced mm -hmm. hour long discussion, what's, uh, what's a key takeaway or two? I think the the key takeaway is that this is why we need to have these conversations, right? Because we came to this saying, all right, risk is what we need to address right now. Urgency is what we need to address right now. Agility or resilience, depending on your perspective, but when you think about the level of focus and maturity that Phil and Karai brought to the conversation, talking about risk appetite, talking about how to address that cross-functionally, talking about not necessarily maybe hardwire structuring yourself to do better if the pandemic starts over, right? That's not going to happen with any luck. Um, I, I think that's why we need to discuss these things so that we can learn from them as they're continuing to happen and hopefully position ourselves to be a little bit opportunistic going forward. Excellent point. Excellent point. And it's got a, a note just to, just to be clear. Uh, so to learn more about Gartner, uh, Gartner.com. And I think Peter, old Peter Bolay is right on the money. He's <laughs> dropped uh, Karai's profile in the comments. So we'll make it as easy as possible to, to have our, um, our community and all the folks in the comments to connect with our guests. And I, I believe uh, art of procurement.com was already dropped in the comments as well. Yes. So a lot of good stuff. Kelly, I love your takeaways as always. There, there's a ton. Um, I find the risk um, discussions and conversations and approaches to be a very intriguing aspect. H have for years, really. The pandemic has just thrown everything on its head. Um, but, you know, one of the um, democratization, I say that right? Yes, I know that's a big, but that's coming up everywhere. That may end up being like the word for 2021. That's coming up everywhere. Well, what's so interesting is, um, so we watched a, an episode of The Office with Michael Scott last night, and there were, he came up with this, this campaign to stick a 10% off in random boxes of paper. And of course, the boxes hit their largest customer and cost the company presumably hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, the phone up the phone from corporate was calling him. Whose idea was this? Who made this decision? And it was a great lesson learned because as much as, as democratization is, is empowering people and empowering people, regardless of department and function and, and where they kind of sit on the, the power structure to make decisions and to have that visibility, you, you still have these, these traditional vestiges that uh, in some companies that aren't quite ready to allow folks at, at all levels and, and all different positions to make those decisions. They still want seven signatures, right. And routing right. the folder. So it, it's just an interesting, uh, I don't know what dichotomy means. I'm gonna go with it and act like that fits what I'm describing, but it's, it's a, it's a yin yeah. and yang. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a battle playing out right here as yes. we continue to navigate through the current environment. So yeah, no, you're not going to be agile or resilient if it takes you 120 days and 45 signatures to make a decision, mm, right? E yes, excellent point, excellent point. Uh, but uh, and at the same time, you know, you're not going to be a employer of choice, and you're not going to be a yeah. cutting edge organization if you don't use technology and and trust to empower your people and let them go out and do big things. And and every decision is not going to work out. That and if it does. We're all way too safe, right? Exactly. Um, you got to so have a healthy attitude towards risk. 
Excellent. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to share this comment from, <laughs> from Mervin here. We got some office fans. So Mervin Clay is Scott's hairstyle inspired, inspired by Dwight from the office. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for not asking that about my hairstyle. <laughs> Uh, Appreciate we, all, that. <laughs> we all know that Greg and Enrique Alvarez are the ones vying for best hair in supply chain. But <laughs> nevertheless, uh, Kelly, a pleasure. Let's make sure folks know As how always. to connect with you and Buyers Meeting Point. Yes, please find me on LinkedIn. You can also visit buyersmeetingpoint.com in both places. I'm easy to get in touch with. As a matter of fact, also artofprocurement.com. I'm, I'm general manager there as well. So you pick your brand. I'm easy to find and easy to connect with. Uh, that's right. And, and a joy to collaborate with. And, and speaking of which it was wonderful to not only of course have Kara with Gartner. We, we love uh, Mike Griswold's monthly appearance with us, but great partners with uh, Phil and uh, y'all's team at art of procurement. So always a pleasure. Okay. So folks, thanks for all the comments and the, and the, um, and the sense of humor and some of the questions we couldn't get to. Most importantly, thanks for your uh, kindred spirits in this journey. It, it makes every live stream. On that note, on behalf of Kelly Barner and Amanda and Clay and everyone behind the scenes here, hey, wishing you the best wherever you are, wherever you're tuned in from. Most importantly, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. On that note, we'll see you next time here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. <music>